from wherever you are around the world. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the world of naked economics. What's that all about? Well, we're going to find out with Dr. Charles Whelan. Dr. Charles Whelan is a professor of public policy and economics at Dartmouth College. So let's welcome him to the circle. Welcome to the circle, Dr. Whelan. Thank you. It's good to be with you. Dr. Whelan has been an author of fabulous books called The Best Selling Naked Economics, Naked Statistics, and his newest release, The Centrist Manifesto, must-reads for everyone. I highly recommend it. So let's start digging in here. So in one of your books, I know the premise is, can economics explain many of our tough questions in life? I sure hope so. Can they, sir? Well, I'd make a distinction. They can't answer the tough questions. Economics cannot tell us how progressive the tax code should be. It can't even tell us whether we should impose a carbon tax or pay attention to climate change. What it can do is frame those questions in very important, tangible ways. They can help, economics can help lay out the trade-offs. It can help spell out with research and theory what's likely to happen if we do one thing or the other. It can prioritize things. So it can help us answer those questions. But if your question is, can we look at the State of the Union address, study lots of economics, and decide what's worth doing and what's not, it cannot. Well, show's over then, Dr. Whelan. Yeah. Now, this is why we have so many different cable TV channels. <laughs> <laughs> so what can data do? Well, data can inform anything we care about. So think about Moneyball, which I think is one of the great uses of data because it's applicable to things far beyond baseball. It can test our hypotheses and show where we're wrong. I mean, the premise of Moneyball is the scouts always thought tall hitters are better, college baseball players are not as good as drafting high school players and so on. Then along come the data to test against these kind of really just back of the envelope generalizations and it turns out that the data don't support those conclusions. So you can exploit that in the case of Moneyball by drafting players whom the data suggests are going to do better, but that's true in lots of other ways. If you care about crime, then you can use data to figure out where crimes are happening, who's committing them, where you want to put your resources, those kinds of things. If you care about white collar crime, so if you look at insider trading, one of the ways we increasingly catch insider traders is we look at data on huge quantities of stock market transactions and we find suspicious activity. If somebody is trading in advance of a merger announcement on several different deals, then we investigate and see if there might be something there more than just good luck or really smart investing. So this is kind of makes me kind of think of Spock-like personality. In your opinion, does it also help to inject some emotion here? Uh, you mentioned Moneyball, and I always think about Oakland A's, obviously, and then Billy Bean. But they always had a knack of finding the player that was ending his career. Stats were going down, and then he comes back to the Oakland A's, and all of a sudden has another stellar year. And for me, a lot of times I think of it going, "Wow, this must be." kind of like his, uh, not retribution, but his redemption in a sense, this unconscious desire to say, I'm still, I still have it. How do we, can we reconcile those two together? Yes, we can. This is a really important point because one of the things that data will not do well and may actually mislead us profoundly is data and what people are calling predictive analysis. So you're looking at, a, at the data to give you a trend, will always miss inflection points. When something changes, so somebody's had a couple of bad seasons the data tell you this is going to continue. There's no reason to believe the trend is going to turn around. If you come along and say, you know what, this person's had a bad season because they were in a stadium with fans they didn't like, or you have some reason to think there's going to be a change of fortune, then you should go against the data because the data will always miss a change in the trend. And it can, in fact, can give you a false sense of security. One of the things that went terribly awry in and around the 2008 financial crisis is everybody assumed that housing prices would keep going up. Why? Because they'd been going up for a long time. There were a lot of bank models, particularly the value at risk models, which I talk about a lot in the book, that included the assumption that the likelihood the housing prices would seriously correct was 0%. zero percent. Zero? Right, zero, right? So we're, we're going to assume that there's a zero percent probability that housing prices will correct in a serious way. Well, if that is the assumption you're working with, then obviously you're going to go wrong and people who are smart enough to say, you know what, this is a trend that I don't think can go on forever, made an awful lot of money when it all came crumbling down. Is this, you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong here, but did they miss that class where it talks about the regression to the mean? They did. That's an important <laughs> one. I mean, some of you may have heard about the Sports Illustrated curse 
which is whenever anybody, this is kind of your point, whenever anybody appears on the cover of Sports Illustrated, it tends to be the apex of their career. If they're a great hitter, their batting average goes down. If they're quarterback, they have a bad season. And, of course, Kerr suggested there's something causal about this, that Sports Illustrated makes you become a worse player. But all it is is exactly what you described, reversion of the mean. When do you get on the cover of Sports Illustrated? Not when you're having a lousy season. You get on the cover of Sports Illustrated when you had a great season. For me, I'm a golfer. I would be on the cover of Sports Illustrated the one time I shot 76 last summer. Well, I only did it one time, so it's almost inevitable that the next week I'm going to shoot 80-something. So it has nothing to do with a curse. It just has to do with the fact that we're likely to capture that one outlier, usually on the upside, and probability tells us you're going to go back to what you do more typically, which is not so extreme. Very fascinating stuff. Now, I know you had a fascinating study where you said you can find what is causing the rising incidence of autism with data. How does that work? Well, this is one where data hopefully will answer this question. We haven't done it yet. For those folks who don't follow autism, this is, we believe to be an increasing condition that rates of autism in the United States and other developed countries have gone up so that now for boys, the numbers are something on the order of 1 in 30 or 1 in 40. It's much more common among boys and girls for reasons that we still don't understand. There are all kinds of causes that have been imputed. Some have been entirely spurious, so you may be familiar with the false connection between immunizations and autism. There was a stretch where a lot of people, they get their children immunized shortly thereafter. This is the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella. Shortly thereafter, the autism symptoms would manifest themselves. There was, there, I think, a trace element of mercury in the vaccines, and people made the spurious assumption that correlation equals causation. Just because they were happening at the same time, one, one must be causing the other. That has been thoroughly debunked. Countries that didn't immunize in the same way we did have the same trend for autism. Once they took the trace element of mercury out of the vaccine, there was no change in incidence and so on. But what remains is that we don't really know what is causing this increase in incidence. Part of it might be an increase in reporting. So 30, 40, 50 years ago, somebody who showed signs of mild autism, because it's really a spectra, spectrum, might have just simply been described as odd or having a learning disability. So we're better at diagnosing it. But there probably is something going on with the underlying condition too. The way we can get at that, and this is why data are so important, is we can gather tremendous amounts of information about families and children, pregnant women, and so on, and then we can pour over the patterns that we find and see using techniques like regression analysis if we can isolate factors that families who experience autism have in common. Do they live in certain places? Are they subject to certain environmental contaminants? Are they of a certain race or ethnicity that's prone for some genetic reason? We haven't answered these questions, but that is what scientists are doing. And it's a collaboration of the data gatherers, because you need the data to answer these questions, and the statisticians who find the relevant patterns. Jeez, that would be really fa be great if we actually could be able to just spot that on the data. That would be fantastic. Here's the bad news. It costs billions and billions of dollars. There's something called the National Children's Study that is designed to look at these kinds of things. It collects data. When you become pregnant, you're enrolled, so there are a whole bunch of tests. They come to your house. They test your house for contaminants. They keep the baby teeth from the children to test for any biological differences. They take samples from the mother. They ask all kinds of questions about your health and so on. But to do that and then to follow those children and families for years literally costs something on the order of 20 or $30 billion. So these answers don't come cheaply. I mean, maybe we'll continue that conversation a little later as we talk about the government and its use of money and the deficit hurting the economy. And actually speaking, just before we speak about that, off camera we talked a little bit about how the media, whether intentionally or not, uh, misuses data. Uh, one of the conversations we were having, um, I know a lot of times the murder rate seems a lot higher to people because a lot of the news only shows a high, I mean, shows a high percentage of murders of homicide, so people start to think there must be a lot more murders than, than it appears to be. Uh, but if you look at the data, it seems like there's not that many murders in, relatively to what people think. And I think they did a study where they asked people how many murders per every hundred, and then they did a data analysis, and it was pretty far off. What do you think about that? I think really what's happening is a lack of using data. Instead, oh. we're relying on anecdotes, 
on vignettes, on things that happened recently, and then we extrapolate erroneously. And I try not to watch the local news, but my parents do all the time. And I think if you watch the local news for three nights in a row, you would assume that half of all houses burned down and that our society <laughs> has become more violent than ever. And to your point, you're exactly right. One of the great untold stories in this country is almost everywhere for three decades, violent crime has been in a steady decline. Places like Chicago, where I spent many years, have fewer murders than they've had at any time since about the 1960s. But again, you turn on the nightly news, that is not the story. It is some gang killing here or there. So I would actually propose that people be more attuned to data to look at longer trends and the like, and you'll get a more accurate story. We as consumers also have to be better. We also, you know, if there's a plane crash, it gets lots of headlines. We suddenly assume that flying is really dangerous even as the data tell us that driving is much more dangerous than flying. Before I read this book, I had, had a conversation with a fellow who told me he was afraid to fly. And honest to God, at the time he was telling me this, he was sitting on a motorcycle smoking a cigarette. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that two things that are a lot more dangerous than flying are riding a motorcycle and smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Cognitive dissonance, huh? <laughs> And it's funny, I, I, the analogy I usually use is the one with the dentist. Uh, two out of three dentists recommend this toothpaste. And I'm always thinking, what happens if somebody came out with a commercial? One out of three do not recommend this toothpaste. Right. <laughs> Where'd well, you, you know, buy that? There's interesting data on that. You would respond differently. Our brains are not hardwired necessarily to deal with data effectively. And this whole field of behavioral economics has arisen, has arisen to fill in the gaps where our behavior doesn't seem entirely logical. One of those is when, this is a very serious one, when doctors say the likelihood of this procedure being successful is 90%, people respond differently than if they say the likelihood of something going wrong is 10%, even though those mm -hmm. are the flip side of the same thing. There are a lot of those kinds of situations where we don't process information in, in a way that seems to make sense, and therefore, for good or for bad, if you present the data in a different way, you might actually change behavior, even if you're saying the same thing. Wow, complicated. Human behavior, very complicated. I guess we can't solve it in 20 minutes today. Economists should read Shakespeare <laughs> because our complicated ways that do not always make sense. Envy, all these other emo human emotions, they matter. Absolutely. Hello, my name's Matt and I'm an addict. My mom was addicted to prescription pills when I was very young, before I even turned one. Are you or someone you know struggling with alcohol or drug addiction? Has everyone given up on you or your loved one? The caring staff at Elite Care understands and treats you as a whole person. We offer individual and group therapy, holistic healing such as yoga, nutrition and spirituality, medication management, and PTSD treatment. By building upon your strengths and rebuilding broken bonds, we help you begin a successful life. With our staff of licensed psychotherapists and doctors, you can be assured of the highest level of care. Elite Care is the best option for long-term rehabilitation from drugs and alcohol. Contact 888-511-0607 for more information. So let's start going towards the world of politics in our second part of this 20-minute episode here. Um, do you think the government deficit hurts the economy? It can. It depends an awful lot on two things. One is whether borrowers begin to lose confidence in our ability to repay the, the mounting deficits, which ultimately become the debt. The debt is just the accumulation of the annual deficits. If for some reason investors lose confidence, as they did in Greece or other countries, and the U.S. can no longer borrow, then we're at great risk. Then interest rates would have to go up significantly to attract capital to continue to fund the deficit and so on. So it is a vulnerability just as a high credit card debt would be a vulnerability for a household. You know, if you can continue to pay it, it's fine, but if your creditors balk and you're left with a debt you can't pay, it's a problem. The other big question is what you're doing with the borrowed money. And in that case, the comparison between the credit card debt or any kind of debt and our deficit is the same. Are we using borrowed money, much of which is coming from abroad, in China in particular, to make ourselves more productive? Are we sending people to school? Are we building infrastructure? Are we doing things that will make us richer in the long run so that we can pay back the debt with interest and still be better off? Or are we borrowing just to pay for day-to-day -day consumption? 
in which case we're not making ourselves more productive, and it's just money we have to pay back with interest, in which case we are making ourselves less well off in the long run and or making our, our children less well off because they're the ones who are going to inherit that debt. That's a good, good answer on that one. I like that. So was this a good recovery, do you think? It could have been a lot worse. A lot of people suffered seriously. A lot of people are still suffering. But when you look at how bad the financial crisis was and how close we came to the abyss, I think things have, could have gone way off the track. In particular, at Dartmouth, I've had occasion to speak to a number of folks who were involved over the Lehman weekend. So, for example, Judd Gregg, who I believe was chair of the Senate Finance Committee at the time, Senator Judd Gregg from New Hampshire, tells a story of being summoned to the Capitol by Ben Bernanke and others, would have been Hank Paulson, on that Saturday or Sunday night when Lehman was about to go insolvent. And one of the principals there, I can't attribute it to Bernanke, but he was in the room, said, look, if we don't figure this out before the Asian markets open, it's really, really bad. Bad enough that the ATM machines might stop working and so on. We have a financial system that depends on trust. It depends on liquidity. It depends on a whole bunch of things that were all at risk when the worst of the financial crisis was going down. So I think we dodged a bullet there. It's been a low, a long slog back, but housing prices are up. The stock market is back. Unemployment is down. I don't know if it could have happened faster or better, but we are finally moving in the right direction on just about every front. Let me ask you this question. We have two political ideologies that are supreme here in America, I guess you can say. And I know you, you wrote a book called The Centrist Manifesto. The Democrats will say one thing. They say the recovery was great. Thumbs up. You did a good job. We're back on board here. We have the lowest unemployment rate, et cetera, et cetera. Republicans say, yes, some of those statistics are right. Some of them are skewed. But the future implications are not so good because of the way we got, uh, um, we got out of that quagmire. Right. What do you think? Are they both right? Are they both wrong? I think... I would frame it differently. I think the striking thing about our economic differences is that the politicians of left and right are much more divided than the economists of left and right. So there are economists who lean left, there are economists who, who lean right, just like everywhere else in the world. But they tend to agree on a lot more things than the politicians who purport to be of the same political persuasion agree on. And let me give you a concrete example. I had the good fortune last spring of hosting what was billed as a debate, but was really just a wonderful discussion about income inequality between Greg Mankiw, who was chair of the economic advisors for George W. Bush, a bright economist, wonderful guy, leans center right, and Jared Bernstein, who's head of, he worked for Biden, I think he was involved with the Economic Policy Institute, center left, and this was supposed to be a knockdown brawl about income inequality. Well, by the end of the night, the two of them had agreed on about 70 to 80 percent of the things they would like to see done. They both like the earned income tax credit. They both want to reform the corporate tax code and so on. Now, there are things they'd still disagree on. But if, if we had then gone to Congress and said, you know what, let's implement the things that these two agree on, that would have been a five-year agenda. I think what's unfortunate about Congress and really causes me to lament the, the political dysfunction is that we can't even legislate in the places where there is great overlap between the two parties. Hmm. That's a good point. And that's really what's hurting, I think, might have hurt the recovery a little bit too. Might have been made a little faster if we could. Oh, I think the world was looking for just a sign of confidence. And the fact that Congress couldn't do anything, that, we, that Congress was willing to shut down the government, that we have no plan for dealing with our long term debt no plan to deal with entitlements, and so on. Those are all things, regardless of what you think we ought to do about them, no plan is worse than some plan. And I think if you took smart people on the center left, smart people on the center right, and you said, put your solution in a hat, we'll pull out of the hat, in a lot of cases, that would be better than continuing to do nothing. How does the next five years look uh, like in the global economy to you? If I could answer that question well, I would be a much richer man. I would be speaking to you from my yacht, <laughs> rather than my relatively small office at Dartmouth College. All I can tell you is the things that matter. On my list, probably at the moment, would be Europe. Can Europe escape from its malaise? There's, it's on the brink of a deflationary, what could be a spiral. 
serious economic distress for countries on the periphery, Italy, Greece, Portugal. If that continues to go in the wrong direction, investors lose faith in the sovereign debt of those countries. If there's loss of confidence in the euro, any of those things could drag down Europe. And Europe is an important engine of growth and prosperity that would drag down the whole global economy. I would worry about that. I would worry about the United States budget situation and entitlements, not the small bore stuff. Whether we do community, free community college or not is totally irrelevant to the bigger picture, which is can we get Medicare, Social Security, defense, the big spending buckets under control. I would look for geopolitical risk. I think the big question over the next 10 or 20 years is how China changes, not will it change. Of course, it's going to have to change as it gets more prosperous. People are going to expect more democracy, more freedoms, and so on. Is that going to be a gradual transformation, or is it going to be something more of a shock, as we saw in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union? That you know, is anybody's guess. Those are the things I would be looking for. And if they, the other thing I would look for is probably the U.S. labor market. There's a big disagreement. I can't answer it over whether unemployment is really as low as it appears or whether a lot of folks just gave up looking. If that's the case, then we're going to need to worry about the shrinking labor force, about groups such as African-American men, older workers who may have left for good. And that's not particularly healthy for the United States in the long run. So those are things I would watch. How they play out will answer your question, even if I can't necessarily say how they're going to play out. I'm looking for answers and policy solutions to the things that we've already talked about. My fear is that the parties are locked in this tribal warfare where neither party is willing to concede ground to the other, even when they may agree. And that's just not a recipe for success in the long run. And that, of course, leads into your follow-up question, which is why do we need a centrist party or at least a centrist movement? There are an awful lot of people in this country, anywhere between 50 and 70 percent by some measures, who describe themselves as either moderate, independent, not aligned with either of the two parties, but just want to get stuff done. They certainly fall out of the two partisan camps. That is a group that is at a minimum underrepresented in the political system. There's going to be nobody in the presidential race who represents the middle. The two sides are going to pander in their primaries to the strong bases. But it also, I think, represents where most of the important policy solutions are going to come from. We have to compromise on the budget. There is no way that we can solve it all with tax increases and pay for entitlement problems. It would, it would put a chokehold on the economy. On the other hand, we could theoretically solve the budget problem by cutting entitlement programs, but not in a way that would be tolerable to most of the American public. They do appreciate some safety net. So the answer is going to be something along the lines of what Simpson-Bowles came up with, the Simpson-Bowles Deficit Reduction Commission, which involved a series of compromises. There needs to be a voice of pragmatism that is committed to solving those kinds of problems as opposed to playing the usual political games and the one-upsmanship. Well, pragmatic politician, I think, is an oxymoron. Some people believe that. We'll find out. Thank you so much again, Professor Whelan. Where do we go to find out more information about you? If you go to centristproject.org, you can find out about the Centrist Project. If you go to nakedeconomics.com, you'll find out about the other things that I'm up to. But I hope you'll be excited and interested in either or both of those things. It's a wonderful show. Thank you again, Professor. The more we know about data and how to read it, the better we're going to understand not only ourselves, but the world around it. That's why I highly recommend Charles Whelan's books, Naked Economics, Naked Statistic, and his recent release, The Centrist Manifesto. Highly recommended. Once again, remember our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, even in the data, we're there. See you next time, everyone.